right, guys, picking up week four of our series, Lectionary. Um, just high level, if you don't know what that is, these are pre-selected texts uh, by, overall by the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and they're laid out in three-year segments. And for the next couple of weeks, we just thought we would kind of go through those and help show you the consistency that is presented in, in the text throughout the Old Testament, all the way into the character of Jesus Christ himself, and what does that look like in our lives, and kind of unpack all that as well. So that's what we're going to do. If you have concerns, is the uh, world going to burn up and fall into a million pieces and what's going to happen in our future? We are going to hit Revelation starting September 8th. So just keep that out there in front of you. Um, as the world continues to hit a feverish pitch, we will deal with all of that madness soon enough starting in September. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with someone by the name of Su uh, Sutsu. Okay, Sutsu. Uh, wrote a book called The Art of War. Uh, he lived in 500 B.C. And it's super interesting because he's this brilliant uh, philosopher and uh, how to fight battles, how to understand your enemy. And what's fascinating is throughout history, any time uh, a, a military has ignored what he's written as like, like governing rules to go by, right? Philosophy to go by in engaging your enemy, when those rules are violated, it is almost always a catastrophe. And so he gives fascinating insights of how to take on your enemy and how you're supposed to, to, to evaluate them. Like, I'll give you a few examples. And you can see, even in the United States, when we followed those, it went well. When we didn't, it didn't. So he would understand that human lives and your resources are like your highest like, like what you need to take care of that at the highest possible level. So assuming your goal is to win a war, how many battles you win or lose along the way isn't nearly as important as the objective, winning the war. That's the goal, right? So he would say, now think about this, it seems counterintuitive, but once you think about it, it's very common sense. He would say, never encircle your, your, your enemy fully. Never do that. And you think, well, why would you... Because his point is, and he goes on to teach, when you fully encircle your enemy, you're forcing your enemy to be transformed into a group of people who now realize mentally it's either death or nothing. And your enemy becomes that much harder to fight. And therefore, you might still win, but you're going to lose so much in the process per person, it's not worth it. So he would advise what you do is you leave a little bit of a gap for your enemy to run. And that seems odd, but his point is, it's actually easier to kill your enemy when they're running. And if they know they have a chance to leave, they will. But if they think there's nowhere else to go, they're that much more dangerous. Isn't that interesting? And then he says, if you really want to transform your, your, your military, put them on the death field. What's the death field? Well, when did the United States have the death field? We call it D-Day. In other words, put men in a position to where there's no plan B. It's die or else. And they will fight more valiantly than you've ever seen before. Put them in that situation and look out. Give them a chance to flee or run, they'll flee or run. Put them in a position where all there is is survival and you'll be amazed at what they can do. And, and so you can look at everything. Never take on an enemy that has the higher ground. That's what General Grant did against the Union military. And that's ultimately what, what collapsed in between the Confederates and Union forces. He didn't follow these rules. He had other rules that we didn't follow in Vietnam. And yet the, the Vietnam leadership followed the same rules. And what was the end result? The end result in these two mindsets wasn't winning battles. It was, we don't have to beat the American military we have to beat the American press and the Americans. Just make them quit and give up. We don't have to kill more people. I mean, it's just fascinating that someone could write something 2,500 years in advance. And the reason I only just give you that is that's like man logic. This is considered the most brilliant. They study him in every military school in the country, even in the United States to this day. And I'm, I want to share that with you because when it comes to God's story, God violates so often every aspect of logic and reason. He puts people in situations that if you were to logically work it out, 
it really doesn't look good. It doesn't look like it should work. It's counterintuitive. In fact, in some cases, it's a really bad idea. And I think sometimes the whole purpose behind that is so that when it works, there's no question, no question, who gets the credit? There it is. So this is kind of this, this interesting theme that's going to happen is you're going to see something right out of the gate here where you have somebody whose back is up against the wall. And it shouldn't work. It shouldn't, but it does. Here it is. 1 Kings chapter 19, 1 to 8. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Now Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom brush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Now let's just hit pause. What, what, what's going on? The back story is, here you have Elijah. He has now been sent into a situation where he's vastly outnumbered. It's not even close. And he's now dealing with an evil king, a king uh, of Israel. He's of the line, one of these kings named Ahab. He has actually said, King Ahab, to have offended God more than any other king before him. And that's saying something, considering some of the sins before King Ahab include child sacrifice. So when you're the worst, I mean, you're pretty bad, okay? And so at this point, there's this moment where he takes on the, these these people who worship this God called Baal. And he says, listen, I'm going to show you that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of Israel is a superior king. And what I want you to do is I want you guys, all you guys who worship Baal, I want you to cut up a bull, I want you to put it on an altar, and I want you to pray to your God that he's going to burn up this, this sacrifice. And they start doing that. They put up the altar they start praying, and in chapter 18, they're marching around, and hours and hours go by. And Elijah does something that you may not know is in the Bible. He talks fantastic trash. And he literally taunts them. He starts saying, oh, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he just has it needs a hearing aid. Yell louder, okay? And he's just giving them the business the whole time. And they start cutting themselves. They start doing whatever they can to evoke this God. Now let's just hit pause. Why would they believe in this other God to begin with? Demonic forces and evil, it has real power. It's not impotent. It has real influence. It has a real ability to move and interact with human beings in events. It's not like it's a nothing burger. Like it, it, is, it has power to it. And so now there's this epic standoff and nothing happens for hours and hours and hours. So finally he says, okay, now set up my altar. Sets up the altar. He says, hey, I want you to pour some water on the bull. Make everything really wet, the wood and everything. Then he goes, now I want you to do it again. Now I want you to do it a third time. And then he lifts up the name of the Lord and he says, please show these people for your sake that you're real. Here comes the fire, it burns up everything, consumes everything, right? And everyone is shocked. And then Elijah goes to the next level. After that, he takes all of these priests, 450 of them that were worshiping this false god, and he kills all of them. Next level, right? Well, what happens is the evil king isn't pleased. But the evil king is one thing. His wife is a whole other thing, Jezebel. Now, maybe you've heard this, maybe you've seen this meme, okay? Like, men will kill you. Women will make you kill yourself. You ever heard this? No, I offended half the room? Okay, here's the thing. Men, it's A and B to C. We square up, you know what I think, I'm gonna knock your head off, right? 
Women are different, and that's okay. That's why women, even in, in like the, the creation story, you're like the 2.0. You don't come right away. You, hmm, how can I make their existence miserable? That's how it works. Even in my own life, those of you that grew up, I knew when I crossed my dad. Yes, I was scared, slightly for my life. And I knew the hammer was coming, but I could do the math. I did this. My mom said, wait till your father gets home. That's going to be the result. Here it is again. We're going to do this thing, okay? My mother, she got a look on her face. Whatever she could find in arm's reach was coming. Shoe, iron, I don't know, right? It's a different logic in that moment. And that always worried me. I ran a little bit faster from mom than dad. With dad, I'm like, all right, here we go. Mom, I'm like, whoa, whoa, let's kick this back to the old man. This is dangerous, okay? I don't know what level you're about to go to. You feel very entitled since you brought me into this world to take me out of it. I don't like it, okay? Let's go back to dad, okay? So here's, it's not all that different because Jezebel is an X factor. And Jezebel is the one that says, okay, you took on the gods. You took on the prophets. Well, what does Jezebel do? She makes it personal. For what you've done, by all the gods that I worship, you're a dead man. And this terrifies him to his core. And it's so interesting because he goes from being someone who is fearless, absolutely fearless, in the face of 850 of these false prophets and calling upon God to all of a sudden he's running from his life because of one woman and he can't get far enough from her quick enough. And it says here at some point he's now probably exhausted and tired. He's disillusioned. And he says, I'm no better than my ancestors because he's probably also now feeling shame. What I just pointed out is probably dancing in his head. How could I have been so fearless, so bold, and this one woman message gets back to me and I can't get away quick enough. What's wrong with me? What happened? Don't I have it? Anything left in me? What's the deal? Questioning himself, his worth, his value. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've been in a situation before where you're so bold and courageous and strong and fearless and you're ready to take on the world. And yet the next moment, inexplicably, maybe even to yourself, you're quiet, you're controllable, you can be moved, you can be broken, you can second guess yourself that quick. What's up? Well, as the story picks up, here's what happens. At once, <clears throat> he lay down in the bush and fell asleep. At once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by the food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord is the second person of the Trinity. Who's the second person of the Trinity within the Hebrew? The angel of the Lord in the Hebrew is Malach Yahweh. Who's Malach Yahweh? The second person of the Trinity. Who's the second person of the Trinity? Jesus. The epic time traveler. And here's this guy having this ex existential crisis, wondering why am I not good enough? What happened? I'm running with my tail between my legs. I'm fearful. I'm worried. And does he get this stern talking to? Does he get lectured on strategy? No. You need to eat and sleep. You need to rest. And before we move on, because we're going to fly through some of these texts, I won't, I won't stay on some of them as long as this one. Here would be my only two cents, like practical thing for some of you in this room. Okay? Here's the reality. No different than this person in this story, Elijah. Every last one of us in this room has a cap of the drama you can handle. Every person in this room can only handle so much conflict, so much insanity. And every last one of us, when you get there to that point, 
your ability to make sound judgment decisions goes out the window. And this is just a practical thing to understand with Elijah. Like, for some of us in this room, maybe you're the fixer in your family. You're the go-to person for every issue that goes wrong. You pride yourself in being everybody's helpline, help desk for everything. But the, ra- the reality is, it will break you and crush you at some point. Maybe you have a friend right now. And you have a friend that's going through an unbelievable mess in their world. There's nothing wrong with helping that person. Nothing wrong. In fact, it's probably a good and faithful thing to help them. But if there's anything you could take from the situation of Elijah, you have to be aware within yourself how much you can handle at a given time. And not necessarily beat yourself up. So what would that practically look like? It may mean unbeknownst to that person... (laughs) Okay, you don't tell them this, okay? But it might be helpful to know, like, you know what? I, in your mind, in your heart, I got to take a break. Elijah had to take a break. His main issue in the eyes of God was you need to eat, sleep, and you need distance. You're going to get back in the fight soon enough. You can only handle so much. And sometimes for some of us in this room that have that role in your family or in your friends... Sometimes you may have to distance yourself just for a bit, just for a season. Maybe it's no more than a week. I don't know. But to get back what you need to then re-engage. Constant engagement will crush you. And soon you'll lose any understanding of what you're doing, why you're doing it, what's the value and the worth, and then you're no good to anybody. And that's what's so cool about what God does. He just ministers to him, and the main issue is you're hungry and you're tired, you need to rest. And when you are lacking those three, you're not well. And we're no different in this room, myself included. So he feeds them, bottom line, super cool. Now here's Psalms 34, 1 to 8. It says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. When we take communion, I'll always remind you, it's what the psalmist said, taste and see that the Lord is good. Right? So God wants to minister to your mind and to your heart, but also to your body, your well-being. It's a holistic thing. And communion is even an extension of that. You hear the gospel. You speak the gospel. You sing the gospel. You pray up to God. You also taste and see that the Lord is good. All these things work together. Super cool. So then Ephesians, this is what Paul would do. Because this is the theme if it's not already coming into focus for you. It's that God will feed you. God feeds his people. God feeds his people. And here's how Paul would help the early church in Ephesus understand it. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work. Do something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, 
but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were, you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just in Christ Jesus forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So Paul flips it. He's not just talking about like an individual body. He's saying we are the body. And the thing about it is, is what God wants people to do isn't always what their sinful desires want and need. You live in an age like never before. It's probably been a few thousand years, maybe 2,000 since it's reached this level where all religions prior that the early church was up against, like, like during Rome, they're all man-centered, desired-centered, me-centered. It's really inconvenient to follow Jesus in 2024. There are things Jesus says that are never going to match your culture. Never. Never has and it never will. Loving and forgiving people you don't like is not easy to do. Praying for your enemy is not something you're going to want to do. There's all aspects of living, of what it looks like to follow Jesus practically in your life that fly right in the face of everything that you're being told right now. You live in a culture that's going to undermine and pick at every aspect of society and culture. How to raise your kids, how to have a marriage, how to be a neighbor, how to be a citizen, how to be an individual. Who are you? What would you like to be today? All of that is everything that you're up against. So the message of Jesus has always been countercultural. and It'll never stop. And we now live in an age where it's more obvious probably to all of us than it ever used to be. Suddenly the words that were written 2,000 years ago are starting to hit much, much closer to home than they may have ever hit in your entire existence on this earth. And this is what Paul is calling people away from other kinds of worship, other kinds of beliefs, other kinds of religion that, that put man and woman at the height of what existence is all about in this life and what makes you feel good beyond what is true about who God is, see? So he flips the whole thing. And what does it look like to feed that body? What does that look like? Well, our last reading gives us greater insight in its actual life and ministry of Jesus. Here's Jesus. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he was given me and raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know? How can we now say, I can, how can he now say, I came down from heaven? Just hit pause. Just know this real quick, if you caught that. You saw this play out even in the Olympics in some cases. When people are for you, they love to celebrate where you came from. They're like, look, they came from nothing. What a story. Gold medal, okay? Now, Know this, and this is the way of the world. When they despise you and flip on you, they go from celebrating where you came from to reminding you where you came from. Who is this? No, no, no. You came from the bottom, remember? That's who you are, and that's what you are. When they like you, it's look at you, you came from nothing. When they flip on you, it's look at you, you are nothing. That's where you came from. Go back to where you came from. And that's the message of all the teachers and the rabbis and everybody else. 
They want to remind him that he's nothing more than the trailer park trash person who came from this nothing area. Nothing good comes from where Jesus came from. That was the attitude and the mentality, okay? And so they go on to say, Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But, they, but here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. By the time Jesus is talking, from the life of Elijah to the life of Jesus, thousands of years have gone by. There's thousands of years of bad blood. There's thousands of years of bad history. There's fragmented people groups who don't like each other, who have thousands of years of hatred and reasons, documented reasons to hate each other. And over the course of it, God's own people, their hearts have drifted so far from God's intended will, heart, and design. And what Jesus begins to do is he flies in the face of all logic. Jesus, when he has the chance to run and to leave and to cut tail and run and get out of a bad situation, Jesus alone goes into Jerusalem. Yes, he's surrounded by people, but in reality, he's already alone and he knows it. Jesus wouldn't just die for his friends and he wouldn't just die for his disciples and he wouldn't just die for one particular group of people. It would not only be the whole world, it would even be his enemies. Who would die for one's enemies? Well, Jesus would. No one else would ever do that. And his whole heart isn't just to get the house of Israel and the Jews pulled back into the faith. It's even the Gentiles. It's us in this room. Because there was no way that this was ever going to work. There was no way man could ever make this happen and be in a right standing with God. So Jesus is saying, listen, now I've interrupted human history. The only way this is going to work, God fed your ancestors physically in their body. Now I'm going to feed the spirit and the soul because you have bigger problems than simply your next meal. And the only way this is going to be solved is for Jesus to lay down his life for his people. Jesus, exhausted and tired, when faced with the opportunity to not move forward to Jerusalem, he takes it. And he does it because he loves you and he loves me and it's to have a relationship with him for all eternity. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your kindness, Jesus. We ask you, Lord, that you would do a mighty and profound work in our lives. God, for some of us, we're exhausted and tired. For some of us, we're so exhausted being the person that's the hotline for the people around us. Give us discernment and wisdom of when we need to hit pause in our lives. At the same time, remind us that nothing will separate us from your love, Jesus. That you feed us, not always because we're worthy, but simply because you love us. This is why you came and interrupted human history. So we lift this moment up to you. We ask for your encouragement and your peace, which passes all understanding. It's in your name we pray. Amen.